Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Etienne Espagne. I'm a senior economist at the French Agency of Development. And I have the pleasure to introduce uh, today this uh, new uh, episode of our research conversations. Uh, today, we will talk about inequalities and environmental changes in the Mekong region, uh, scoping review. Um, this uh, work has been uh, funded by the European Union Facility on Inequalities, which uh, is, uh, has been managed by IFD and my colleague uh, uh, Onda David. Um, before I introduce uh, the speakers uh, today, uh, let me give you a few informations on how uh, you uh, can uh, ask questions uh, for the discussion after the presentation. So, on the right side, uh, on the right hand side of your screen, you should have chat and questions. So, uh, don't hesitate to ask questions throughout the, uh, the presentations and the discussion. Uh, you can also ask more technical uh, questions on the chat. And I'll do my best to translate your questions to uh, our speakers. Uh, so our speakers today are uh, Lin Huin. Uh, Lin, you, you have been working extensively on this uh, systematic and scoping review on uh, inequalities and environmental changes in the Mekong region for a year now. So this, uh, you have been working uh, within uh, IRD, the French Institute of Research for Development. Uh, but before that, you were also working for the French Institute for Asian Studies in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam, or Cantor uh, University, the Institute of Socioeconomic Development Studies. And you hold a PhD uh, in environmental integrated water management uh, from the Center for Development Research in, in Bonn. So you, you will be uh, presenting us the results of this extensive uh, review uh, in a minute. But I would like before that to introduce also our uh, distinguished uh, discussant today, Jean-Christophe uh, Dipard. Uh, you are an agroeconomist and uh, researcher uh, at the University of Liège in Belgium. Uh, you are based in Cambodia since 2002. You have been involved in several research and development projects relating to agricultural development and natural resources management in Cambodia, but also in the Mekong region as a whole. Um, and this basically led you uh, to work on issues such as the modernization of land tenure system, land use planning, labor mobility, agroecology, and commodity crop value chains, all topics which are indeed included in our uh, exercise of uh, scoping uh, review. Um, so, without any more uh, introduction, I think that, Lin, you can start presenting. Um, you have between 20, 25 minutes to present, to present your, uh, this work, and then we will have 10 minutes uh, of discussion with Jean-Christophe, and then that would leave us some 15 to 20 minutes uh, to, uh, for a broader discussion with, uh, with the audience. So, Lynn, the floor uh, is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everyone, and thanks a lot for uh, coming for today's webinar. So, as Etienne already mentioned about the research program, we're focusing on the topic of inequality uh, relation with the environmental change in the Mekong River Basins. And our work has been based on a systematic review of literature. So um, I will further explain what would be the reason behind of the research program as well as uh, the methodology before coming to the results. So the need of the systematic mapping and a review on the topic is an urgent need because um, as we already know, um, not only in the Mekong region, but climatic as well as uh, environmental stressors have been an issues in the regions. And that impact is actually getting uh, more obvious. And then people are getting affected differently depending on their position, their identities, and their, if we could say their capital, like social capital, financial capital, or human capital. So this research program coming up with um, 
with the fact that we have an idea that there could be available existing uh, literature in the regions. So in that way, if we could already making a systematic mapping of those available knowledge, and maybe there's some well-rounded uh, discussions or data that could already come up as a recommendation for policy actions. So we have to work on the scoping review, or I mentioned here the systematic mappings, or and then we will further go to a detailed topic on land tenure or water right as a systematic review, which will be the next step. And we also, at the same time, we also having the uh, collective book with the collections of different um, case study in the region. With the we have eight chapters so far, and supposedly we could introduce that um, also this year. So as uh, we mentioned before, the methods being used in this uh, research is called scoping and systematic review. So is it different uh, than a conventional review in the sense that is having a really comprehensive search in several databases based on an equation that being um, analyze and review by expert committees. And we always, during that search, as well as a, the uh, screening process, we always do the stratifications of inclusion and inclusion of certain items. So different criteria being set. And we also doing the search on great literature. So not only online database, like Web of Science, Science Direct, and several other. We also do search on the uh, institutional websites as well as the publication from NGO and from the thesis from the library from the regions. So the process took a little bit more than a year and we started with a meeting in November 2019 where we actually got a, and then asked the expert to contribute uh, to discuss about the keyword that we could come up as a um, search equations and in that, what is called a test list is a list of literature that is must be involved. So in that way, we could justify our equation is good enough to continue searching. So in that way, we work in, uh, and thanks to the team in five uh, countries of Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Thailand, and Myanmar, that we did the search in two to three months. And um, after that, we enter the step of play training, abstract training, a title screening, abstract training, and full text screening. So the full text screening took the longest time, and we just recently finished that. So we are working currently on the working paper, on so uh, to uh, analyze further on the uh, detail of one topic. So today we will introduce you the reason of the systematic mapping. So the data collection was based on, as I mentioned before, we discussed with the expert to identify the keyword. So we have the relation between inequality and environment. So we identify in the set of four components, it's called PECO, populations, exposure, comparator, and outcomes. So the population here on the first relation would be those group of people being affected by the exposure would be the environmental changes. And then in that way, if the literature having a comparative factor is like to compare the situation before and after the event of, uh, for example, extreme climate event, or between different regions or between different groups based on their wealth being a poor and rich. And then because of those impact, it will come up as an outcome with either inequality or it could also be livelihood insecurity, land to new rights issues or human rights issues. So being uh, the data by being set are carefully recorded. And as mentioned before, we search in five terms. And this would be the, um, the reason, so in total, after two, three months, we uh, ended up with 18,000, a little bit more than that, of items, including um, journal articles, books, book chapter, reports, thesis as well. 
And then after duplication being done on Zotero program, we have ended up with like 14,500 uh, items to go further for screening. The first, uh, the title and abstract screening being done between three reviewers, between me, Etienne, and Stefan Lee all of us are here today. And then entering the full text screening for the systematic mapping, where we are actually screening for the details, um, uh, for the detail of the item, the articles and paper to see whether the components are available or not. I will come later our criteria. I hope that you still hear, hear me well, right? Because there was some connection before. Um, so later, of course, I will tell you the criteria that we exclude or include the paper in the full text screening, like reading them. But uh, in terms of number, so after abstract screening, we have 7,200 of the full text to read. And then among them, we have more than 800 of the item actually being like blog posts or a newspaper, but sometimes they are really good analysis, but because of their nature are different than journal article or a book chapter, so we separate them for further screening. Also because of time constraint. And then we also have some uh, literature in local language, but because of time constraint, we could not really go further on that. But the number was not that much compared to the total number. So we screen full text of 6,042 uh, items in a team between me and uh, four other um, reviewers. And we have at the end 2,355 being included with the criteria being set by our team and also reviewed by the expert. And then 96 among the no paper, we have the 96 item that is called overlap paper, which means the paper that actually written on the similar study that being um, reviewed on really on the other study. So it's we can't overlap, but they are still relevant. So those 2,355 enter through the systematic mapping. It will come up with the reason I will present here to you. Um, present here after. With, uh, first of all, so these would be the cost of full text where we, for those yes paper, we actually coding the information to give out uh, in terms of title, author, bio, bibliographic information, and then the important information of PECO I mentioned before. So it's need necessarily happen that we have P population exposure and outcome to be included. If it's not, it's a note for that paper. Sometimes we found a really interesting paper, but it's not going into our criteria, so it's a note. So I will skip this for now. So um, in total of like 2,300 paper, we, those papers are actually being published from 1978 until 2020, April 2020. At the time, we kind of like stop our searching for literature, and amongst them, uh, we could see the majority of them would be journal articles, and then we also have a big amount of report from the uh, institutions and NGO from the region that would thanks to the effort of the team from five country that really looking in depth into them. In terms of geography, like between countries that um, they are beside those paper or chapter are looking at the regional level, like Mekong level, Asia, or Southeast Asia, so global level. We are actually having more publications on Thailand and then Vietnam. And uh, we have less publication in Cambodia and uh, Myanmar. And if uh, later, uh, we will see in Myanmar actually the majority of publication are published recently and based mostly based on the work of NGO and institutions. And we have less publication from Laos. So of course it's actually showing us about the imbalance in terms of research or knowledge production capacity between countries. 
Of course, there could be little bias in our search. So probably there could be some capacity uh, due to capacity in searching purely in Lao that we might need meet some literature. But so far, it actually reviewed the trend of Thailand and Vietnam in terms of research productions. So uh, I've read, uh, we read this up to between periods and actually it's showing really clear how uh, research in terms of impact of environmental change on uh, vulnerable or peoples or community at risk are getting higher in 2000s. So it's starting in Thailand actually in 1990s and somehow it's growing in own country in 2000s and it's a huge uh, evolution of research in uh, the last decade from 2011 until now. And we could see here that um, they, they are, they could, there is an explanation in terms of why the topics of the impact of changes in terms of land use change, the policies, and then different environmental change and climate change are being more focused in since 2000. It's also part of the um, idea of development project are actually happening in the regions in the 1990s. It's a booming period. And somehow those development like hydropower or water infrastructure projects or land concession due to commercial plantations is growing enough to show its impact on different groups of people like ethnic group or smallholders and somehow that topic are getting more attention in 2000 especially in Thailand and it's growing in different countries especially if you see the red color that would be Myanmar so we see uh, good representations of uh, research from Myanmar especially from NGOs and it, institutions in terms of uh, land issues. So we also trying to do a little exercise, sorry for the um, quality of the picture, probably not so clear. Um, we use Boss Viewer to quickly um, mapping the relation between the authors writing on the topic in the regions. So on the left hand side, you see that like the bigger the name, meaning the people having more publications, and the zoom in uh, photo on the on the right hand side was showing you the relation between um, between uh, expert uh, uh, the author writing on the region. So we see quite a lot of like um, there's no bias of course and then no discrimination, but there are quite a number of like foreign uh, expert foreign name uh, of expert working in the regions is highlighted. And uh, actually, a uh, junky stuff like your name is actually also big somewhere on the photo, but there would be another color. Um, but it's have to mention like junky stuff like those experts have been uh, staying and uh, plus working in the region, so they understand the region in the way that is similar to the um, local expert, and also there. If we look at further, so we also have some group of uh, local um, experts working on the region with a connection with a, kind of a different scheme of connection between author is good to look at. So by looking at the database, most of the research have been working mainly on the rural area and the highland area. Of course, there's other part like coastal area urban as well or multiple location or stating in general about the human address but it's showing us um, the linkage really strongly later on when we look at the um, population being investigated in the literature that would be the farmers the poor and the ethnic groups and the highlander so um, those group of people are actually having have gained a lot of attention because of their vulnerability to the changes and also their disadvantage in negotiating their right over the use of the resources. And it's also thanks to a lot of work from especially in Thailand because there is a program, land governance program over there to do the research in the region. It is exploring truly the um, the impacts of different policies or different uh, evolution in terms of land use or agrarian change on the group of peoples. 
And then if we see further, so we see different other groups that actually less represented in our data would be migrant, the elders, and then the idea of non-citizenship in accessing to resources, refugee, and then the minors as well. So this would also get like yet another reminder is of what we explore in terms of um, in terms of exposure, environmental change, we actually focusing on different aspects of environment, would be land, water, agriculture, the air, the research extractions like mining, pollution issue, forest, climate change, of course, natural disaster, and the health issues. And the impacts on the population are, are differently um, being categorized, like the well-being, including their it, the poverty as the outcomes of the impacts on livelihood insecurity in general, and sometimes it's the mortality, like their life cost because of the disaster like tsunami in Thailand, or being people being displaced, or people have to migrate because of environmental change. And then in some order would be the conflicts that happen because of the change. So because resources are being concessed or being less available compared to before. So conflicts happen between the peoples themselves after the event or even between the peoples and those with the policy maker or the investor. We also capture some other like really slightly but really interesting to see the social aspect as the impact would be social differentiations or it actually disrupt the social cohesion or the cultures of the peoples because of the changes. Gender deviated impact also being recorded, and then the quite a big number in terms of vulnerability to climate change or disaster risk, the health risk to pollution, and then we also have a, a bunch of literature in terms of adaptation, resilient capacity. So looking at the capacity of different groups sowing the inequality between different groups. So of course you might uh, question like by looking at only the uh, environmental change and the populations and the impact, how we could identify about inequality. So, so actually by the availability of comparators or the focus on certain group of people like the farmer, the poor alone or the ethnic group, it actually reflects the inequalities of the environmental impact. Of course, we um, also found research that focusing directly on inequality that it will come in. So trying to explain that a lot because I don't want to just scare you with the um, table later. In general, we also again using the voice view at the same to um, map the co-authorship. We actually mapping the keyword from the title and abstract alone, and actually it come out really nicely, fit into our um, data by reading the full text itself. It's showing three uh, domains that being presented strongly from the topic. So the red and yellow part is actually talking a lot about the land reform, the conflict issues, and national park and the protected area policy affecting different group of people and the height, the huge tribe, the heartland, and then the blue in the middle, you see the climate change issues and natural um, disaster risk. Of course, if we zoom in, there's more keyword we pop up, but uh, due to the space, I cannot zoom in at this moment. And the green part on the right corner, you could see those related to uh, pollutions and um, pesticide issues and wastewater issue or cadmium or arsenic uh, problems. Of course, they are not really clear cut. There's some like the young chai and then, um, yeah, it's not really clear cut here, but somehow it really nicely sitting in different corner of the three biggest team that we identified from the literature. So this would be the meant reasons of what we are doing is called the literature mappings. So mapping means that we are trying to show that the quantity of research on different topic and relation in that way we could identify the research gap. So you can see the, the darker or the, the darker the color here 
meaning that the more research or the more item have been doing a study on that topic. So we could have national park and protected area, hydropower water infrastructure, research reform policies is actually the environmental changes in the regions. So national park protected area is a good policy in the sense to protect the environment. But those actually happened in the 2000s or even earlier. Those policies are actually ignoring the role of local or we call some of them called indigenous people who used to settle in that land before. So in that way, it actually um, affecting the livelihood they had to resettle to someplace else. And it depends on the resettlement policies. Some of them are getting, um, getting into uh, issues of they cannot sustain their livelihood or their social cohesion being disrupted. Then we could also see disaster and climate change issue also being presented strongly in the literature and pollutions as well. Pollutions um, including air pollution, water pollution, pesticides and toxic issues. They are a growing interest um, in the last five years, a little bit more than that but it's only showing the attention, also probably the obvious um, impacts of those issues are getting into um, the light. So we have also other part like agrarian change is, um, it's actually pointing into the commercializations of uh, agriculture are switching between Sweden farming or shifting farming to commercial farming like maize, rubber plantations. Part of them also linked to the land concession or land wrapping issue like China's or Vietnamese are uh, investors in Laos in terms of rubber plantations and in Cambodia too. So uh, if we look at here, so we actually having women group having also, a fair amount of research talking about the topic is a gender deviated impact, but it also less um, presented in compared to the other. Fisher, Sifaro, and then children, elderly, migrant, actually, and refugee, um, actually less presented in the literature. Urban people, actually, compared to rural people. Urban poor, petty urban poor are presented in the study, but it's less compared to the rural people as we could say traditional target of research in terms of their disadvantage. And we also uh, capture some other group like uh, small medium enterprise and then a street vendor in the city or veteran are being affected by different changes in the city and are in rural area, but they are really less represented. So in this picture, it's actually showing uh, us on the left hand side would be the environmental change and then the right and on the um, horizontal line would be the, the impact. So we could see about the well-being itself or poverty issues are actually the, uh, the most mentioned uh, impacts of environmental change on people. And then we, when we come to the issues of uh, land use and water rights or the access to the resources like forest or water or to the fish, we are actually seeing the conflict issue and right issue. So sometimes it also include evictions from their land, the asset reductions and the conflicts and resistance as well. So environmental resistance or environmental movement is also one of the key issues pop up in the last five years, especially in Thailand and also in Myanmar. So recent capacity are linking very much as the impacts of climate change and natural disaster. So including flood, extreme events, tsunami, drought, salinity, intrusions, uh, subsidence issue actually are not really much presented our, in our database. And like I mentioned before, if you look at like the, um, the uh, the far right, uh, we see the inequality and interest issues are actually mentioned directly. So there is a certain amount of literature are talking about that, but not that much. 
So, um, so I will skip this slide because we I already like slightly mentioned before about that. So I just uh, go directly to about conclusions on the knowledge gap. So the research uh, on environments that link to fisher, seafaro, migrant, refugee, gender issues, and some other non-traditional groups are really needed in terms of their exposure and access inequality. So urban and peri-urban poor, uh, yes, they are being um, researched and being studied to um, show how they are vulnerable or being affected differently by environment, but also more research are needed in uh, those way. So we also found the research and policy discussions on the impacts and alternative strategy for environment and research governance in terms of like both to protect the environment, but also to sustain the livelihoods of those related to that environment. So for example, forest management. So there have been work on community-based forest management, especially in Thailand and Vietnam, but there's still, uh, still some more work need to be done and it should take into account the inequality embedded and acknowledge that um, the community have also changed themselves during the last decades because being affected by different um, developments or uh, activities. So many community, they are actually getting, uh, they are changing their livelihood or their practice in their land already. So it's not, the similar one that we used to think like um, Hmong people or Karen people are linked to um, either forest uh, protections or forest destroyer. Yeah, yes. So environmental inequality and equity are interested issue. The terminology is quite new from the literature and we also need that to like more direct research also probably actually promote the um, more attention on the matter and also to promote more policy discussions. So it could enhance the awareness and change for the discussion of uh, we could call transformative strategy. So um, that would be a little bit, yeah, I have a still on time. And thanks a lot. And I would definitely would like to thank the chance to thank the, my team, the uh, ATN, uh, Stefan and Alexi, as well as the expert uh, we have been working uh, with, John Kistler, thanks a lot for your support course, during the process, and then the team from five different countries as well. So thank you very much for your attention, and all questions or comments are really welcome. Thank you very much, Lynn, for this, uh, this nice presentation. Um, Again, so you 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 were really uh, the the one working uh, heavily on the topic and ma managing the team of uh, uh, of researchers from five different uh, uh, countries. Um, I, I I want to uh, to present someone who is on the stage with us today, and it's Stéphane Lagré, uh, so a co-author on this project, uh, leader of the One uh, uh European Union project, uh, um, working with uh, research institutions from uh, these uh, uh, five different Mekong region uh, countries. Uh, and Stefan uh, is also as associate researcher at the University of Nantes, uh, holds a PhD in geography, and uh, is based uh, in Vietnam, um, between Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, so that you know uh, everyone on stage. Now, I think we can move on to uh, Jean-Christophe's uh, discussion for five, 10 minutes of comments and discussions. Yeah. And uh, for the audience, there, there have been some questions already, but don't, don't hesitate to, to ask more for, for the final discussion. Uh, the, the Jean-Christophe, the floor is yours. Thank you. The connection should be all right, but otherwise just give me a sign and I will adapt, yeah? Okay, so thank you very much for giving me a chance to, to discuss this presentation, but also for the opportunity to uh, review the working paper, uh, which is coming along. Uh, so first of all, let me congratulate all of you, uh, Etienne, Stefan, Alexi, and Lim, of course, for the massive work that you have undertaken. We understand that this is just the beginning, but I think it provides a quite solid ground for further research. 
and I, and I remember uh, a few weeks back when you presented the preliminary results, Etienne, you said that this is potentially a mine of gold. Uh, and I can see it. I can see the, the, the gold nuggets basically coming up from the ground. Uh, so there's more, more to be done, I guess, and uh, potentially there's a lot to, that can be done, but uh, I think it's promising. So the, the discussion I will do is basically focusing on the different aspects of your presentation, so the, the conceptualization, the method, the findings, and maybe some words on the knowledge gaps or key next steps. So regarding the, the conceptualization, I think the framing is very great and I like particularly two things. One is that you have made very explicitly that inequalities is not only about distribution of assets, but it's also about the recognition of values and identities, as well as the capacity to wait on decision making. Uh, and I also like the way that you have tried to place the connection or the linkage between inequalities and the environment as a two-way relationship. So influencing each other with feedback, it's not always the case and I think it's very, very important uh, aspect. But from there, and assuming that the research will also be discussed with policymakers or will help inform policy making process. I'm also wondering if you could frame this perhaps a little bit more widely in terms of economic development. You, you already stress that um, the inequalities and the environmental change that we are observing in the region here are not natural consequences, but they are basically outcome of policies which have targeted uh, and prioritized for and foremost the growth of GDP above, above, over basically uh, anything else. Um, and the assumption I think in the, in the policy making was that, that the growth would basically progressively uh, percolate through all the social groups and all the different strata of the society and result in basically eventually the decrease of inequality between the countries and within the countries. But actually, what we have seen over the last 20 years is actually not the case. It's not happening. And I think your research basically contributed also in showing that. And another aspect which is also related to this is um, refers to the work of some economists, like, for example, Gael Giro, you know very well at BFD, who, who says that growth and inequality are not independent process. So the production of wealth grows and the distribution of wealth are basically interrelated process. And they, actu they actually show in those researches that quite convincingly, I guess, uh, that um, the growing or sustained inequalities can be actually a burden uh, for economic development, for economic growth. So I'm just wondering if you could maybe use this line of thought to, to frame your paper. It could perhaps make it a bit more attractive to policymakers who have really you know, clear, clear focus on, on GDP and growth. So this is this is for, for one aspect. Um, on, on the method section, the methodology, I like the way that you have formulated the search equation to identify the, the different, uh, different studies, articles, newspapers, articles, etc. Um, and in those search equations, you reflect very well on this uh, two-way relation between environmental uh, changes and uh, inequality. So I think it's very consistent with your framing, which is great. Uh, I like also the way that you have uh, presented the criteria for the inclusion and the exclusion of the papers very, in a very transparent way, as well as uh, all the codes that you have used to tag the papers, which is quite not it's a bit unusual to have this, this level of transparency in papers, so really congratulations for that. Um, I think the, the method is really great. Um, I, I could understand a little bit more, of course, huh, because I had the chance to read the paper, but I think it's really, really good. And I think it's also very informative for a lot of researchers working in the region. And I think it can be possibly for people who are willing to continue a little bit what you have started to do or looking at more specific issues in specific geographies. I think it's a very good, uh, very good model. Um, just one observation on the, on the question of adaptive capacity and adaptation. Um, so the capacity of the individual or groups to uh, adapt, to learn and to transform the livelihood system as a result of either growing inequalities or uh, environmental change. 
Um, I, I found the, at the moment these aspects are a little bit buried inside uh, the outcomes, yet they have a very strong bearing on inequalities and environmental change. And I'm, I'm just wondering whether, I don't know if it takes a lot of time or not, you know, but, but just by reframe, reorganizing your, your search equation and your research, how to make this, this adaptation and this resilience basically a little bit more, more prominent so that you would target you know, to uh, research which are more oriented towards solution rather than problems. And I think this is also something which is quite attractive to policymakers and, and donors in general. So to look at solutions to inequalities and environmental change rather than just focusing on the diagnosis of, of the issue. Um, <clears throat> On the findings, um, so of course I had, again, I had the chance to look at the paper, so I have a bit more inside view than uh, what Ling has presented here, but um, I have two, basically two, two observations. One is in, on the first topic that you have uh, discussed, it seems to me that you focus uh, much on ethnic issues and uh, land grab, land concession. Um, and of course, these are very important issues, no doubt, you know, particularly in Myanmar, where the, the ethnic problem is very, very big. But what I did not see much uh, is all this question of migration from low land to other land. You know, migration of people basically uh, moving rice paddies, paddies field in the low land because either of inequalities, because they have no land or near, near landless, or because of environmental problems. And they decide to move up to the, up to the uplands, basically to make a living on, on agriculture. So they are basically looking for, for farmland. And I think this is a very important, we see this across the, the region, very prominently in Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, a bit less in Thailand and Vietnam, because this, this movement took place uh, long ago. Than 30 years ago, um, but it's, they are very important. I think in terms of uh, inequality, in terms of environmental change, uh, they also contribute to, to conflict because the land rights of these migrants intersect with uh, state land concessions and also ethnic minority groups. So these issues are, I mean, in the policy level, a little bit below the radar. But I think the literature documents these 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 movements are quite quite well, I think, and could be worse maybe uh, looking at these a little bit more. Um, something which is also interesting that I read in your in the working paper is that it seems to validate the fact that climate change studies are very, very focused heavily on basically the, the direct impact of drought or um, floods, extreme weather events. Um, and they are not, these analyses are not very well integrated in, uh, with other forms of vulnerabilities. Um, so perhaps a challenge for climate change studies, and I think you, you validate, you seem to validate uh, these ideas that it should now understand climate change, how it, how it impacts, how the impacts of the climate change, sorry, materialize through economic and social inequality in a much more integrative way and a systemic, uh, systemic uh, process. Um, so finally, on the knowledge gaps and next steps, um, well, what I, I miss a little bit, overall, it, I have very good impression, you know, but if I have to say something which is a little bit missing, uh, is what I mentioned a bit earlier, uh, the lack of really solution-oriented processes. Um, so solutions which are activated by individuals, communities, or even governments, you know, to address either inequalities or environmental change or both at the same time. So for instance, processes like zero deforestation rubber, sustainable rubber, or the agroecology movements, the sustainable rights platform, the green certification, all of these processes basically are, you know, very interesting, I think, to, to document and are offering basically solutions to tackle inequalities and environmental uh, change. So I don't know if you have in, in the papers, you have resources to do that, but I think that would be a good direction to explore. So overall, I think you have done a very terrific work and I think it's a very good basis for further researchers uh, like me and hopefully others 
to uh, to dig to dig uh, further and find more gold that is in, uh, found in the mine. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, very much, Jean Christophe. So I think uh, we have lost uh, Lynn, so she might uh, come back uh, in a minute. I hope. Sorry, um, yes. Okay. Welcome back, Lynn. Uh, yeah, maybe sorry. before you answer uh, uh, or you you we give some elements uh, of answer to uh, Jean Christophe. I, I want to. Uh, if one more information on the, the work that has been done is that, of course, this uh, huge uh, repository of uh, articles and papers will be uh, uh, will be given. So there will be a link with all the all the references and all the papers related to this work. So it's also transparent in this way, uh, and of course, um, researchers are more uh, expert on certain aspects of this inequality uh, uh, environmental change nexus might be uh, willing to uh, uh, to use this repository uh, uh, to uh, to go deeper on one subtopic of this uh, of this, uh, of this complex uh, uh, regional problem so that's just what I, I wanted to say and of course uh, you were talking a lot about the working paper uh, it, it, it will be very soon uh, uh, published uh, and, and um, uh, in the audience will be able also to see it uh, very soon. So. Lynn, if you want to to uh, give yeah, a few thanks minutes. a lot, Lynn, uh, and thanks a lot for Zhong Kishtev. And actually, thanks a lot, like by us putting those uh, comments and then um, discussions about that is actually making it clearer because I know that my presentation was a bit short and a bit tight. Uh, to give out more information, but um, yes, we were trying to because um, so let's say there's several um, things that I have to mention. Yes, John Christoph mentioned a lot. We focusing on the two way of relations. So the other the other direction that I did not mention a lot on the presentations is about how inequality preventing people from. Um, getting or like getting certain way of life or factors in terms of environmental conservations are actually impacting on the environment in terms of negating it. So um, thanks a lot in terms of, uh, like when you mentioned about yes we could frame that in the way that how growing inequality could it be a burden in economic development in the regions. And that definitely uh, a good starting point because actually this afternoon um, in uh, in the presentations about like how why um, economic development like hydropower development have been so dominant in the region. Be, like Mid and Carmington were talking about that because it's a different interest in terms of policy making in the region in the last year. Is environmental conservation is only a growing interest recently. And when we talk about country have to talk to each other to find a way how to govern the Mekong River, but then country is meaning the policy maker. But then the local voice also needs some space as well. But then there is different way of projecting the issue or seeing the matter as the environment. And uh, it's the same when we see at the NGO report, like looking at directly at this like man or eviction issues. They really looking at closely from the, from the eyes of the people being affected. But of course they do not having an overview of a regional level or a regional, like a national level. It, uh, it's also, there could be a bias as well, but also need, policy makers also need to take into account that aspect because we are looking at inequality in the sun because SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, are in, we do not want to leave anyone behind. So it's the, also the end of the policy making. Um, the, the issues of migration from the lowland to the highland, yes, is where presented in the literature. And actually, yeah, it actually mentioned a lot in the conflicts issues between um, 
lowlander and highlander in terms of uh, land negotiations or land availabilities. Uh, but that could also be because within our bias of, of building the criteria, we actually not like taking that so clearly in terms of presenting it. So yes, there um, I admit, but then also nice that you mentioned that because in that way we could also, because we say there will be a review, meaning a narrative synthesis of the topic of land tenure rights or water rights or forest access. So in that way, we will go deeper into those literatures and then really pick up some narrative from the literature that are available. Adaptation really resilient capacities. Um, we know that it's so now yeah, it's a bit not really fitting into the outcomes as um, same as the other. Um, this we have to admit that those papers actually talking about the solutions are being being stored in a separate folder, but it like many of them are actually being getting a no from our inclusion inclusion criteria but of course when we discuss about the land tenure or land right or research right issues like those topic will be included in as the background paper and the whole database that uh, etn mentioned a six thousand um, two hundred something item will be included so like further further access will be um possible to really extract if we really looking for uh, some solutions oriented um, papers. Um, I'm not sure whether I, if I missed something. Um, oh, that's great. We, we don't see you anymore. Well, I, I don't see you anymore, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah, actually, I missed like, the, the last part of your presentation. Sorry. No, no, we, can, we can hear you clearly. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you, thank you, Lin, for 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 the for the these, these answers. Uh, maybe we can uh, switch to some questions from the audience, and and we have at, at least two questions uh, from Enda and uh, Sarah, so colleagues from IFD. Uh, let me just uh, uh, ask them uh, directly. How from Enda? How do you interpret the lack of literature on some of the interactions? Lack of data, lack of scientific interests, lack of funding for such research projects. I think that's one really important question in the, the way you can read the, the key table uh, of final table of the paper. So, uh, how do you uh, how do you say that there is a lack of, of literature based on this table? Um, and let me ask also the, the question by Sarah. Uh, were inequalities analyzed only horizontal between social groups or also vertical revenues? So I think we might have answered this. So we're dealing with all kinds of inequalities, but uh, if you have some elements to, to give as well. Yeah, uh, sure. Um, in our interpretation, because of course our said in no way that it could be exalted. So we try our best. And in that way, looking at the data and somehow we could say it's comprehensive enough to say that it's not a lack of data, but it's more a lack of scientific interest. Yes, it is. And then if we look at the imbalance between countries, so there could also be the lack of uh, knowledge production facilities or capacity. So um, we could see a drawing um, like a big number in Thailand and Vietnam uh, compared to the other countries. And then if we see, we look at Myanmar, so there are big knowledge, like big uh, publications from NGO and institutions in terms of land dropping, land possessions, and then environmental movement over there. Um, lack of funding. So for this, I would not, uh, we would not have any kind of background or evidence to really uh, say that. Um, yeah, but maybe it can or Stefan, if you. No, I guess when when you show the, the the map with the different intensity of studies between the countries, the implicit interpretation that you may have is that there is maybe a lack of funding in some countries for this kind of research. Um, but we have we don't have actually 
more more uh, direct elements to, to to conclude that, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, in uh, yeah, to uh, Sarah Barton, uh, thanks. And uh, yeah, I did not really uh, making it so clear in terms of inequality we're looking at. Uh, we of course trying to adopt different framework, but in practical, we are looking at the uh, first of all would be um, exposures, uh, inequalities in terms of exposure to climate change, to natural disasters and then different environmental stressors like pollutions. And the other one would be access inequality. So the access to the resources, to land, to water, to forest or forest products, to fish. Um, the, we also having a focus on like, the inequality in terms of like impact from the policy. So there are different policy in terms of land policy, water policy, forest policy, like protections area. And then we also have recently it drawing as well, adaptation and mitigation policy, like mitigation to climate change, but it's policy actually displaying or resettling people. It's resettlement, but then if it's not doing in a good way, actually causing problems to the people being resettled. And then the last one would be about the, we call uh, the uh, lich and some other author is called contextual or procedural. So looking at the, whether people are having the right to participate or having voice um, in the policy making process. So that would be the, uh, the last one we look at. I think that is on the chat, I think. Yes, then go, go ahead. If you see one question you would like to answer from the chat, uh, and maybe then, yeah, yeah. and maybe then if Jean Christophe or Stefan have any uh, uh, final final element sure. or question. Uh, yeah, I'm very quickly. Are people are in the government be aware of the problems? If researcher make effort like this to reach, um, this would be kind of a big question to. Um, yeah, I think scientific uh, word uh, people are trying to reach that, like having policy dialogue to convey the issues. And then if we see, look at NGO in Thailand and Myanmar are also trying to um, raise the voice from the local people also as the resistance to uh, certain issues uh, from the sun state of Myanmar, like to raise the issue and try to resist to the power of the militants. Mm, in terms of dissemination, like being uh, supported, being funded by the EU and also supported by AFD and with the network of Wannacy from Stefan uh, Latter being the coordinator, we also communicate this research to the stakeholder beyond the scientific uh, committee, of course. We also, in our kickoff meeting and also in our um, workshop, final workshop, we had um, invited those development agencies as well as trying to reach uh, to some uh, like NGO or governmental agencies. But of course, so far, we that dissemination will need more work to do. Uh, Lean, I think we have uh, two actually very interesting questions. Sure. Uh, on the question side, so uh, how far do the trends and key themes that have popped, it over, uh, popped up over the last five years in the literature are correlated with issues raised in the public space or in public making sphere? Uh, so in which areas do we have a policy drives research or a research drives policy framework? I think, I'm not sure we have the answer to that, but I think it's quite an interesting, uh, uh, interesting point. Uh, Raise here, um, and an important information as well for us is that the UNDP includes environmental impacts into its Human Development Index since last December, uh, and that that may be interesting also for the framework that that, that we've been working on. So I don't know if you want to <laughs> elaborate on, on that. Mm, um, That's also for Jean Christophe and Anna. Uh, 
So who drives what in terms of the policy, the policy themes, and the research interests? Um, you, you, you want me to answer this? I can, I can try. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that the, the situation, the, the policy, policy research interface, it's very, very, very different uh, in each country. Is it okay with the sound? The, the, I think the, the, the two the two countries which we have, which have uh, managed to um, to establish uh, or to give value to research produce to knowledge research uh, produced by research are more likely Vietnam and Thailand and I think the policy making process in those two countries is really looking uh, much more carefully at what the scientists and what the researcher have to say um, and. And we see this in how the, the research process and the policy making process align much better in time, which is a bit different in, uh, in Laos and uh, Cambodia, I would say, in Myanmar also, where the, um, the time window for policy making is always very, very short, very narrow. And the research, the pace of researcher does not actually match this time frame. So, uh, Policy makers and, and researchers do not really talk to each other because, because of that. Um, it's increasingly getting better, uh, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not easy. So according to you, it's a question of, let's say, country or maybe political uh, uh, yeah, I, context. I think it's a question of political history, you know, and, uh, of, you know, uh, a question of valuing knowledge also. Which is but, I think very very different, very different from uh, from uh, from one country to another. Is it is it possible that it it's also different from one uh, theme to another uh, within this uh, inequality uh, environmental change question? I don't know. For example, climate change might be uh, uh, yes. more science uh, driven, uh, while other topics would be more policy uh, policy driven. I don't know. Uh, do you have these kind of examples in mind? Well, I, I have, I have an example where uh, the, the researcher bringing on the on the table issues like uh, land grabbing, land conflict. Uh, these these questions are completely uh, not unaudible for for policymakers uh, because they touch on very sensitive points and also because uh, the way they are communicated by the researcher or activist is also not, not acceptable. Um, of course, climate change. Yes, climate change. There is a much more uh, openness, much more openness to uh, discuss uh, because there is also a lot of funding is coming in, and uh, the time horizons is also makes makes the you know the accumulation of knowledge much more possible, and the meaningfulness, basically, of knowledge into policy making uh, process much much more important. But I mean. I mean, research and knowledge, it's just one element, you know, as, as we know, in the region, you know, into a policy making process, you know, there's many, many other aspects which come into play and uh, which basically the, the research and the research uh, researchers have to um, sometimes fight against. You know? So all this vetted uh, interest and um, decision making process, which are completely untransparent. So it's, it's very, it's, it's very difficult. So, Lin, you yeah. want to? Uh, maybe you could add to that, to, uh, yeah, to some things you already mentioned, like in Vietnam, for example, if we, uh, that would, I would know more, like, for example, in the Mekong Delta, the policy actually driving research recently by showing funding and providing or asking the scientists to jump in and to research certain issues, but of course, the angle they are looking at probably it different than um, the overall inequality idea it could be. So they are looking at, for example, likelihood um, issue in terms of any model to follow, like certain patterns of fish or rice 
plantations uh, to replicate or to continue. But things like social issues, like cultural issues, or could probably could be a bit ignored. But of course, if we look at the community-based uh, management forest, like forest management or uh, water management for the toilet shop in the recent discussions in Cambodia, in forests in Thailand and in Vietnam, that would also be more like the policy to account the voice from the um, scientists as well as from the uh, NGO or from the people by newspaper. But of course, when we're talking about um, Drunk is really mentioned a really great point in terms of what is is sensitive. It means like land issue or land reform or, or land concession or dropping when we term in scientific um, knowledge. It's actually against the idea of economic development or expansion in Cambodia now. But climate change is more like one and that everyone looking at that so it actually not sensitive so it so that actually also recall about the way that um scientists could communicate on uh, about the idea of what could be done or policy recommendation thank you thank you lynn um Jean uh, Christophe, you had something, uh, another element? Or, no? Okay. So I think. I think just one, yeah. element, one element on the previous question <clears throat> on the, the reason why there is, so, there is uh, so much disparity between the countries in terms of knowledge production. Um, yeah, it's true that Vietnam and Thailand are basically standing out clearly. Uh, but if you look at the, I don't know which, which slide it is now, but if you look at the slide that um, Ling presented, you see that for Vietnam and Thailand, there has been a huge increase in knowledge produced, basically in, in the 2000-2010 decade. But then it's, it's stable, and even in Thailand it drops, it declines. Whereas the other countries, the, the basically the, the boom of knowledge production is happening a bit late, a bit after, you know, in the 2010, 2015, or 2015, 2020. So, and I think in Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, we see an increasing, increasing pool of researchers who are really, and not only expats, you know, not only foreigners, but uh, national researchers who are doing, able to do great research. Um, so that they are, they are a bit behind, but I think in terms of capacity now, they are catching up. Yeah. Thanks for for these uh, these uh, insights on uh, research production in, in in the region. If there there is no other question, we may we may uh, finish here our uh, discussion. Uh, I just want to uh, again uh, thank you, Lin, for for this uh, nice presentation, and and John Christophe also for uh, these uh, these comments and and critics on the paper. Um, we will uh, the the working paper itself will uh, uh, most probably be available in March uh, in the IFD uh, publications uh, together with the policy uh, brief uh, and with this repository of the whole uh, literature uh, that was uh, handled uh, in this uh, in this systematic uh, review. So um, thank you again. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Uh, the audience as well for the, for the interesting questions and we close here this uh, research uh, conversation episode and uh, uh, see you soon on this uh, on this new uh, webinar uh, format thanks again thank you everyone thank you thank you